Stephanie Slocum Schaefer, professor at Shepherd University. Stephanie, good morning. Good morning. So nice to be here. Great to have you with us. Thank you. You were on a short list of people being considered for Professor of the Year. I am. Feel tell, very blessed and honored. Tell me about this. Uh, so, uh, Shepherd University nominated me for Professor of the Year. It's an annual award through the Faculty Merit Foundation, the West Virginia Faculty Merit Foundation. Um, I was a little surprised, I will say, because the, I got the word that I was nominated and I was very excited. And then they said, oh, and here, by the way, is this big application packet that you should fill out for us. Um, so that ended up being quite a job, um, but also kind of a pleasure because I got to look back on my 20 years at Shepherd and um, think about all that great stuff I've been blessed to be able to do and all the opportunities I've had as a teacher there and a professor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I submit that application and uh, then heard in January that I was a finalist. So there are five finalists from across the state. Uh, and this includes all the colleges and universities, both public and private community college and uh, every higher ed institution in the state can send a nominee. So. And uh, how did you wind up at Shepherd? You said 20 years now. Yeah, so I... Um, was working up at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania, but I live in Maryland, and I was in administration mm -hmm. <laughs> at Gettysburg, which was fine, but um, I really missed the teaching, which is the thing that I'm most passionate about. So a job came open in my field at Shepherd, and the rest is history, I guess, as they say. <laughs> and your field is? Uh, political science. Mm -hmm. So I teach American government and research methods, which, uh, Students don't particularly love the research methods, but I make it fun. <laughs> so, uh, any idea what percentage of your poli sci students go on to become attorneys or people who work for elected officials or become elected officials? Yeah, so um, our students do it all, but a good proportion, I would guess, maybe a quarter, go mm -hmm. on to become lawyers. Um, the pre-law program at Shepherd is associated with our department, so um, many students do that. We have students that go on to grad school, um, but yes, we have students that work on campaigns that end up running for office, mm -hmm. both locally and you know on a larger scale. We have people that work in D.C. Um, yeah, our students do great. Who's your most famous alum? Oh, now you ask me a question. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I don't know who that would be. We have got one of one of my favorite students. Um, Tyler has been a lobbyist in D.C. and now lives out in California. Um, Gino Cisco, who is the county like health him. administrator, yeah. right? He's fantastic and is a Shepherd grad from our program. I would like a Gino Cisco. I could I could talk <laughs> to a Gino Cisco. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, you two ladies have something in common. You're both married to prominent judges. Oh. So, yeah, so, and uh, uh, Stephanie, congratulations on your recognition. I'm going to ask a question that's very hard. Uh, you have many, many skills. Uh, what do you think is your major reason that Shepard nominated you to uh, for this very illustrious, prestigious award? Well, I think the, the, Teaching is the most important aspect mm -hmm. of this award. Of course, leadership and um, advising with mm -hmm. students, um, but I think the teaching is the big is a big part of it. So I've done a, a bunch of research in the area of pedagogical mm -hmm. um, quality and mm -hmm. ways to improve teaching, mm -hmm. and so that's uh, I think part of the reason, perhaps, mm -hmm. why I was nominated. Um, and also the leadership component, because I'm involved with the Stubblefield yeah. Institute. I was, I was going to come back there and say yes. Yeah, so, yeah. um, and also was chair of my department mm -hmm. for seven years and uh, honors director for five years. And I'm currently co-coordinator of Gender Women's Studies program. Mm -hmm. I think those things also played a role. Uh, you did some research last year on the political side of things, how people react to uh, their party identification. And I thought that was very an, an intriguing piece of research. Would you explain that very quickly? Yeah, so that was a wonderful opportunity yeah, yeah. I had um, through my association yeah. with the Stubblefoot Institute. I did a national level survey that looked at the relationship between civic engagement and attitudes about civility. Um, and 
uh, also taking into account how partisan a person is, because I that there's some evidence in the political science literature that partisanship also plays a role in civic engagement. And so it, the results were really interesting, right? So partisanship is certainly a very important factor in driving people to be engaged in civic activities. And I measured that through 13 different possible activities that a person could do. Um, and the attitudes about civility, you know, also have an impact. And but the opposite impact of what we expected to find, we expected to see that when um, people were very concerned about a lack of civility, that they would be less engaged in the political process, thinking maybe it turns some people off from being involved in politics. And we actually found the opposite. The more concerned people were about the, the problem of incivility, the more politically engaged they were and the more interested they were in having discourse. Um, so that was really interesting finding. Not uh, quite what we expected. Isn't that interesting? Most, yeah. look, it's similar to the results when you poll people about negative ads. Most people hate negative ads, but more people respond to them. Yes, people remember negative ads yeah. much longer than they do positive ads. Fascinating. Yeah. Maria. So obviously, as a professor, um, you teach students, but clearly you have been a student yourself over the course of, of what you've um, been doing. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, the whole research component, because um, folks that I know that are involved in universities and everything, some really love the research. Mm -hmm. I sense that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and others are just kind of like, oh. Okay, this is a little part of it that I have to do, so. Um, so I guess it's that saying, you know, I went to school and I never left, right? So I, when the, I have the perfect job, I think the best job ever because I'm always in school and I'm always learning. Um, not only f from my research and staying on top of my discipline, but from my students. You know, I think of education as a two-way street. You can't make a student learn. You know, you can facilitate them and create an environment where students learn. Um, and because it's a two-way street, we have stuff to learn from students, right? So being open to their different life experiences and their perspectives is always teaching me things. You know, it's, that's fantastic. Um, Shepherd is the perfect place because we have a small kind of institution where I can have very close relationships with students, something I value very much. Um, Shepherd really values teaching, and, and that's the kind of environment that I wanted to be in um, because I love teaching. I mean, the relationships you build and watching students evolve. But Shepard also has pretty high expectations for staying current in your discipline mm -hmm. and doing research. So it's a, it's a balance. You have to, well, we, we call it a three-legged stool. You, you teach, you have service to the university and the community, and you have your research. So. How, how would you say, what's the biggest difference since you've been at, the, well, you've been at this probably lo much longer than 20 years, but 20 years at Shepherd, what's the difference now between students 20 years ago and students today? This is interesting because I um, had my interview in Charleston yesterday. And that's what they and asked. And that was the first okay, question Okay, then there you go. <laughs> you should have been in Charleston. Right? Yeah, maybe I was. No. Um, I've seen a lot of change in students. Um, I, I do think we've seen change because of the pandemic, um, sure. obviously. Um, I think there, and, and I wish it was a more positive story, but I feel like um, students are struggling a lot more than they used to. And that was exacerbated by the pandemic, but certainly not the cause. This was a trend that I think I saw before. Um, at Shepherd, also, our students are, many of them, are, working full-time, have families that they must care mm -hmm. for, um, you know, have a lot of responsibilities outside of school. And I think I've been seeing those responsibilities increasing and the burden on people increasing. And that makes it difficult to, to you know, proceed through college in a timely way and, and finish and move on and become productive, engaged members of our society. So um, I, I've definitely seen that. I think because of all those responsibilities, we, we have sort of a almost a crisis of mental health issues. Some of it, again, made much worse by the pandemic. Um, but, you know, many of our students are struggling with anxiety and depression. So we I see that a lot in, you know, 
playing out you know, in the classroom. The, the points you bring about mental health are incredibly important here. And I think about uh, my, my sons are in their 20s. My next door neighbor's kid just graduated from Penn State in the past year. And I, I think about the stresses and the pressures that these kids undergo. So uh, it's 2023. So this year it'll be 22 years since 9-11, which means these kids that graduated from college were babies uh, during 9-11, which was the first tragedy of their lives. Then we had the pandemic which caught them in the middle of what should have been the best years of their lives and just killed it completely. Then they, then they went and lost grandparents and loved ones and, and whatever, and everything that they loved to do, they couldn't do anymore. Uh, and, and then this generation has grown up with their grade school classrooms being shot up and their college campuses mm-hmm. being shot up. Is it any wonder that we have a mental health issue with yeah. this generation of kids? They never had a chance. And I don't know how to solve that. I mean, I feel like we're all, you know, sort of living through a difficult period. It's it's um, sometimes feels quite overwhelming, mm-hmm. everything that's happening in the world. Yeah, you're right. But I'm going to push back a little bit where uh, there are a lot of pressures put on all of us today. But we're not the first time nope. in, in our history we've had that. No, we've had World War One and Two and two, depressions. And, I, I get and, that. And Korean War, the Vietnam War. So there are a lot of pressures that in no way diminishes from the point that we're talking about now. There are a lot of pressures. Uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, kids have 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 survived these pressures in the past i'm optimistic the kids in the future will survive these pressures i think we we have the the uh uh the structure uh to achieve i have the i think we have the structure for people to take advantage of the situation and make the best of it yeah i mean i think that students are way more resilient than they give themselves credit for um and i worry sometimes that our culture sort of um encourages folks to to feel that they're not resilient yeah. or feel that they're they can't mm-hmm. they can't overcome these things um and so yeah that's a bit that's a bit of a concern yeah. but i too am very hopeful and if, and of course i have the privilege of working in education and that's a very hopeful thing yeah. right i i have the best job in the world because i know i'm making a difference but also because i get to see students evolve and 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 better themselves and reach their green their dreams and their goals so i'm i'm very hopeful also because i think going forward there are lots of ways to to move forward Stephanie, when do you find out if you have been selected? Uh, I, I wish I knew. So in the past, the Faculty Merit Foundation would hold a banquet in the spring in April. I think it was in April. And they would invite all the final, all five finalists down to Charleston, and they would do this banquet. And at the banquet, the winner would be announced. Um, of course, over the last couple of years with the pandemic, they have not been doing this banquet. So it's unclear what the plan is for this year. I don't think they've quite decided. So I don't know. Do you know your competitors? Do you know who they, have they been announced? Um, they're announced, but I'm not sure who they are. Okay. Um, okay. I did run into one of my competitors yesterday. When you were doing the interview. Okay. Out. Yes, yesterday. He was a lovely man. Yeah. And, um, you know, we wished each other luck. Yeah. And so, but I discovered in my conversation with him that this is the third time he's been a finalist. Um, which I think is interesting because Shepard, I don't think, typically renominates the same person. You know, mm-hmm. you get your one shot at yeah. glory. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. And then, uh, and then you're done. Um, but yeah, he, he said he didn't even think being up for the third time was a record. Yeah. Yeah. So he thinks yeah. there's others that have been, you know, renominated multiple times. So think I about doing all that paperwork, Stephanie, <laughs> three, four times. Don't you just want to put your head down? Yeah, on but the now desk that and... now that it's done. Right. Be, yeah, you, you would just be just updating. updating. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Do you have Do you have any idea, Stephanie, the number of people that were originally nominated? You know what? I do yeah. not know, yeah. and I'm guessing that it probably varies quite a bit from year to year. Yeah. Um, we were estimating maybe forty, somewhere in the yeah, forty sure. range. Yeah. And and institutions can nominate more than one person. Um, I'm not sure why they yeah. would do that to have two faculty members mm-hmm. in competition with yeah. each other, but that's you can they can nominate as many as they yeah. want. So, yeah. but I uh, ask you a very topical question because uh, this just uh, I guess went through yesterday the Senate and the House and onto the governor's desk. And that's the campus carry <laughs> bill, which is going to become 
uh, a law. I, would, I imagine the governor would sign this mm-hmm. without much delay. Any thoughts on this once it becomes law? Wow, you're putting me on the I spot. Am. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, I would just say that universities got a lot of concern about the campus carry um, and is preparing to to think about how it will be implemented on campus. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of concern on campuses. The sense that um, there's a lot of issues when you have students living on campus and there might be alcohol or drugs involved, right? That there's concern about um, people carrying on campus or you know living in housing and, and having firearms there. Um, so yes, there's a lot of concern. How about you as Dr. Stephanie Slocum Schaefer in your classroom? Yeah, I think a lot of faculty are very concerned about that. Um, I suspect that it won't amount to very much change. I mean, we already live and work in West Virginia and people, you know, carry Mm -hmm. uh, throughout our society. So I don't think that it's going to be. I don't feel personally threatened by that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's gonna amount to very much, but I also understand very well why people would feel concerned about that. Our guest is Dr. Stephanie Slocum Schaefer. She has been uh, selected as a candidate for West Virginia Professor of the Year. And this is so secretive, she doesn't even know the date that they'll name her (laughs) as the winner. Let's hope, fingers crossed. All done in a secret society, from what we understand. Uh, When does the school year end for you? Uh, In April. Do you do anything in the summer in terms of additional instruction? I do not. I have never taught in the summer. It's optional at mm-hmm. Shepherd. Um, I'm a big gardener, and I have an orchard, and my son has beehives. And so in the summer, I tend to focus on those things. That's a lot going on there. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Right. But now, last year, you did some research. Will you do research again this year? I, I may. Mm-hmm. I may. Well, it, it sort of depends on um, what we decide through the Stubblefield sure. Institute and a couple other things. Um, there's always research percolating yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my life. <laughs> Being as that you've been instructing political science and a lot of folks who have gone on to political uh, work, mm-hmm. have you ever considered running for office yourself? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't take long to get that answer. No, out. <laughs> I have no. I like to study it. I'm very interested in poli- in political behavior yeah. and people, how people behave politically. I have no interest in, in being an elected <laughs> official. <laughs> I'm going to probe a little bit on that. So, uh, is there a particular reason? Um, maybe I know too much about it <laughs> <laughs> from an academic perspective. Um, yeah. I, I, I think what it takes to to be successful in politics, I don't have those skills and I don't have those particular um, interests. Mm-hmm. So, okay. My next question has to do with your uh, you instruct in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you're choosing a career path and, it, and it's going to be education and instruction, what made you decide that the college level as opposed to high school or grade school was the better route to go? So it's interesting. Um, You know, education wasn't really in my wheelhouse, wasn't something I was thinking about at all as an undergraduate student. I was a double major, international relations and Spanish um, as an undergrad and uh, came out and got my first job doing blue sky law for a securities firm. So I was Mm -hmm. basically a glorified paralegal in Washington, D.C. And I was bored out of my brain. I was like, this is just mind numbingly awful. (laughs) <laughs> and was trying to decide what to do with my life. And I took a job, a, a volunteer position, teaching English as a second language, because I had been a Spanish major in college. And I loved it. I mean, I just loved the relationships I developed with the people that I was tutoring and working with. And I thought, this is what I want to do. And again, I loved school. I've been good at school my whole life. So uh, I, I couldn't wait to get back to school. So. Um, the teaching came from that volunteer job, English as a second language volunteer job. And then, you know, that's when you want more education and that's what a PhD typically does. I mean, in my field, mm-hmm. you know, that's typically what you do. You go on to become a college professor. Where did you do your undergrad work? I did my undergrad at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And your master's? Uh, master's and PhD were at the American University in Washington.
Very good. I'm, I'm done with interviewing her. I'm selecting her as Professor of the Year on my list, Bill. Yeah, uh, Shepard has uh, presented a very strong candidate. Uh, best of luck to you, Stephanie. I Thank hope you, you get so it. much. Any final questions for Dr. Slocum? Jay? Same, same. Good luck to you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, you, you deserve it. Thank Let's put you. it that way. Well, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank well, you. it's been great having you here and wonderful to meet you. Dr. Stephanie Thanks, Slocum Stephanie. Schaefer.